Today's podcast of Hellbent for Horror is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash hellbent for horror. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. Hi, everybody. Before I start the show today, I want to tell you all again how grateful I am that you are listening to Hellbent for Horror. I absolutely love doing this show, and I'm so happy that we're starting conversations. I'm hearing from listeners, and it is so great. I'm glad I'm able to give you something that you feel good enough about to take the time to write me. I know you're busy in your lives, and the fact that any of you have ever taken the time to send me an email to tell me what you like or you don't like really means a lot to me. Hey, I'm just a guy who loves horror and wants to share that love and appreciation with everyone. Hellbent for Horror is a grassroots effort. I write the episodes. My wife is my producer. My brother-in-law helps me with sound editing. We do it because we love horror. I want to keep doing this show at the level you've become accustomed to or better. So I'm starting a Patreon page for Hellbent for Horror. If you don't know, Patreon is a crowdfunding site for people to support creators of all sorts of work. People can support creators by signing up to Patreon and pledging a set amount for each episode that I would release. If I don't put out an episode, you don't get charged. If you like Hellbent for Horror and you feel inspired to contribute even as little as a dollar, it will really help me continue to devote my time and effort to the show. Your patronage enables me to expand my horror horizons and hopefully yours. Only contribute if you want to. I've set up different support levels, and there are little tokens of thanks at each of the levels, from access to Patreon activity feeds to, say, monthly web hangouts where we can talk directly about horror. You can find my page at patreon.com and then do a search for Hellbent for Horror. I'll also have a direct link to it on my website. Also, there's all kinds of ways to support. Your support also can be writing reviews of the show on iTunes and Stitcher so that we can get found by other horror fans and grow. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you. It is a pleasure. In August of 2015, I traveled to Chicago to attend a horror convention. It was the first true horror convention I'd ever attended. I went there by myself. I didn't know anyone in Chicago. I went there with one goal in mind, one objective, start conversations about horror with real horror fans. Well, it was really to see if I still had a passion for the subject and see if I wanted to dive into crazy things like, oh, I don't know, a podcasting about it. So of course, I was trying to find my passion. And if I was going to do that, I would need to find some passionate people to do so. And that's when I hit pay dirt and of all places, not in the show itself, but in the hotel lobby. I saw a group of guys in black t-shirts sitting together. I found out that they would meet each other at horror conventions throughout the year and they would just talk horror movies until dawn sometimes. And these guys knew what they were talking about. They had opinions, they had philosophies. They also had a sense of humor about it. And it didn't stop when the convention was over. These guys are so passionate that they create their own labors of love around horror in their own lives. I informally refer to them as the Algonquin Roundtable of Horror on my podcast, but they consider each other convention family. And so what I wanted to do is have them, at the end of the year, talk about all things horror. So guys, Thank welcome. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks very much. And we have a few people who are here today that were able to get uh, with us. Uh, we have Damien Glonick, John Kitley, Brian Martinez, and Greg Olheiser. And I'll be introducing each of those guys now. So Damien, I wanted to talk to you first. Uh, Damien is the co-creator of Living Dead Dolls. He also writes articles for Evil Speak Magazine, Ultraviolet Magazine, and Echo Base website. So tell us a little bit about what Living Dead Dolls are and what inspired you. Uh, well, I mean, horror in general was definitely the inspiration. Um, we came up with Living Dead Dolls in 1998. Uh, we were heavily into the uh, whole 
model kit garage kit scene at the time and uh my partner Ed's mother was really into dolls, and she had these uh, like blank doll kits uh, laying around. And he, you know, asked if he could get some and fool around with them and kind of painted <laughs> these uh, like morbid little Wednesday Adam looking uh, dolls and uh, painted up a bunch. We brought them to a convention that we were doing at the time, and uh, they all sold out in uh, the first night. Uh, so we tried it again at the next convention. Again, they sold out. So the two of us kind of joined forces and figured we were on to something here and how much you know we can expand upon it. And about two years later, a, a toy company approached us and said that uh, they were interested in uh, what we were doing and would, would be interested in them taking over manufacturing and distributing uh, the dolls and keep us at like the creative helm and designing. So it sounded like a good idea, and uh, we signed, we licensed Living Dead dolls to them. And almost 20 years later, we're still pumping them out. Excellent. So you write articles for different publications as well. Uh, is there a certain style or a period of horror that you like writing about the most? Um, I probably tend to write more about like uh, from like the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, movies. As far as the style, I I like to write the way I talk and try and make it personable like I'm having a conversation with someone instead of trying to be so uh, philosophical or studious about it. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. I probably picked that up from reading Chaz Ballin uh, way mm -hmm. back in the day because he, he always yeah. left such an impression on me and with all the way he just wrote everything like humorously. And I, I try to do that in my writing to kind of make it more entertaining instead of kind of boring with fact, fact, fact. Right. Uh, what's your favorite article that you wrote? Oh, gosh, uh... I have no, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> you know, every like for Echo Base, I I do uh, like uh, Thirty One Nights of Halloween Horror, where I review a, a different horror movie every day, and I, those are always kind of fun to do. I, and I try to keep it where uh, I do movies I've never seen before, so it's always kind of like a fresh opinion instead of something I've seen a million times. And you know, so is everyone else. And you know, right, right. How old were you when you got bit by the horror bug? Uh, my dad was always into horror, so it was pretty early on. I mean, I remember he took me to the theater to see The Car. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first, I think, horror film I remember seeing. Uh, and, like, we were, like, the drive-in, Piranha, um, The Evil. So it was all like, nonstop from the 70s. Uh, you know, I was exposed to all that stuff really early on. And I didn't really, it just seemed normal to me because it was always around. You know? Right. I love the movies that you're talking about. Those were kind of formative for me as well uh, at that time period. I just, uh, the car has my favorite line ever, cat poo. <laughs> <laughs> so John, I wanted to talk to John Kitley now. Uh, he's the owner, operator of Kitley's Crypt, one of the web's longest running horror sites. He also writes for Evil Speak Magazine and Horror Hound. And that Horror Hound features his Rondo award-winning column, They Came from the Crypt. He also attends several horror conventions and events throughout the year, spreading the love of gospel uh, and gospel of horror reference books. So you also, one of the things that you didn't mention is uh, you write reviews of horror movie soundtracks, and that's almost weekly on the Kitley's Crypt website, so you're very prolific on that. What do you think is the best all-around horror soundtrack? Um, oh, geez. There, there's so many great soundtracks. Creep Show is always one of my favorites because it just it epitomizes what a horror soundtrack, I think, should sound like with the, the background noises and the, you know, the growling and there's lightning and stuff. Um, but the, the main thing is soundtracks are just like an audio horror film. So if, if it's from a movie that we've seen over and over again, they just automatically trigger those emotions and feelings of, of when you've seen the film. So it's kind of like a an audio remembering of of these great films, right? Right. What's the worst movie with the best soundtrack? Bad movie, great music. Uh, Trigger Man. Um, oh, really? Yeah. I, I, oh no, his name just completely went out of my head. Who the director was? Um, I can see of, the poster. I can't. Yeah, remember it's how. one of Larry Fessenden's. Uh, yes. One of his uh, subordinates, uh, Ty West. It was Ty, Ty West, West, I believe. Um, the soundtrack is amazing, and I've tried to watch the film twice, and I can't get through fifteen or twenty minutes of it. It it looks like someone. It looks like Michael J. Fox was the cinematographer. 
<laughs> I know what you're talking about. I've seen it. Now, uh, I kind of liked it. But then again, I was on a real uh, binge for the Glass Eye Picks guys, all the people that were underneath Larry Fessenden. It was like every week there seemed to be another movie that was kind of coming on Netflix. Now, they probably had some kind of deal to have that happen. But it was like, whoa, one after another of these really interesting, extremely low-budget movies. Now, where did your love of horror movies come from? What what got you hooked? Um, I the town that I grew up in, we didn't have a movie theater, so going to the theater to see something like that was rare. Um, so my introduction really came from TV. And growing up in the early 70s, there was so many uh, TV shows, series like Night Stalker and Night Gallery, um, Circle of Fear. Um, that's what really introduced me there. And also there was a ton of great made-for-TV movies Mm -hmm. um, around that time, like uh, Frankenstein, the true story, and right. um, just a, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that involved Satan, which was awesome. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and even better, in the 70s, sometimes uh, the bad guys won. So it, right. it was a nice, nice change to see it wasn't a happy ending. It wasn't everything was, you know, tidied up in a bow. Um, so that's where I really started to love this stuff. And then in my uh, late teens, early 20s, it just exploded. Right. What, what kind of movies did your family like to watch? Were they also horror fans, or was there any other kind of influence in the house? No, no influence at all. My dad probably never watched a single movie in his life, um, mm. just working too much. And uh, just, no, it, movies were not a big thing. It wasn't something... Um, like it is to us, we were people that, you know, if you're a movie person, um, you understand that, but if you're not, you can't under, you, you, you don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. So for some reason it just hit home with me and that's where I went off. Right. Now you occasionally do interviews with filmmakers, uh, makeup artists and actors on Kitley's Crypt. What was the best or most fun interview you ever did? Um... Oh, man, there was a few of them. Honestly, interviewing Ted Michaels was mm. awesome. Um, uh, he was a lot of fun. Um, oh, man, I'm trying to think who else. Some of them, they're just, when, you, when you're not trying to be professional, I guess, I, do, I would just ask him questions that I wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a little bit more, um, I don't want to say, I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain. I don't ask typical questions because it's, it's stuff that I either I want to hear or it's about movies that most people are not going to ask about. Right. Um, I, I When I interviewed Carolyn Monroe, I asked her about the black cat she did with uh, Luigi Cozzi, and which she's just like, oh, my God, I can't believe anybody knows that film. <laughs> so that that's what I like to try to do. Um, one of the other ones that I, I really liked was when I interviewed Doug Hobart who is the guy that played the jellyfish creature in Sting of Death. Um, <laughs> yeah. I did not and, know that. Yeah, this guy had been in movies for, and he worked with Lon Chaney Jr. and John Carradine, and um, he was just this guy that was a, a, a spook show host back in the, in the 50s and 60s, and he just had so many wonderful stories that nobody, not too many people know about him, so he was a lot of fun. I did want to veer off, but Brian Martinez. So we have Brian here. Now, Brian is the psychosexual deviant editor and producer of the only internet show on the planet that's devoted to the love of Italian Jolly, the Giallo Room. He is also the writer and director of the short film Gelato Giallo and the upcoming film My Friend Lisa. And he's a real weirdo. <laughs> but uh, Brian is... Uh, Seriously, he's possibly the nicest guy I've ever met, and yet he's a huge devotee to Gialli, which is one of the rougher horror styles that's out there, and it's sometimes even tough to defend to even some horror fans, let alone people who are casual viewers of thrillers. Uh, what is it, Brian, about Giallo that you relate so much to? Um, what is it about Giallo that appeals to me? Yes. Um, just everything. You know, it's, it's one of the few genres out there that um that pretty much has my like trifecta of like what i love about film you know it's it's beautiful looking it the the, the music is always amazing or mostly always amazing um there's a lot of gore a lot of sex there's um 
a lot of killing and it's not just killing like brutally it's like killing with style you know um it's just such a like brutal genre and and it's i don't know it's a lot of fun so you you've been a filmmaker uh you've created a, a short film already and you're in process with my friend lisa uh, tell us a little bit about this new project my friend lisa basically there there's um there's like a creepy pasta or whatever on the internet um mm-hmm. that, that describes you know um a, a little girl and she draws these pictures of her friend lisa um and you know everybody thinks it's just an imaginary friend but she tends to be a little bit more malevolent and um and it, it was just such an Im- interesting premise and and i you know i searched and there was nothing devoted to this particular piece and i was like you know i think it would be kind of cool to just create like a little short film devoted to that like premise you know because you it's more like in line like if you ever watch a haunting on uh, the discovery channel or whatever like those mm-hmm. those things like just creep me out you know i'll watch like a whole marathon of that show and i wanted to like capture that sort of tone where it's like you know th- this could be real but it you know it's it's like a supernatural thing um mm-hmm. and, and i don't know i just i felt it was like out of my normal wheelhouse in terms because i just love italian cinema and this just seemed more like you know mainstream kind of horror so i thought it would be cool to like work with you know kids and and ghosts so how'd you get indoctrinated into being a horror fan who corrupted you my mom like she totally <laughs> She, she, she like uh, she fed my my weird desire for horror. Uh, you know, early on, like it, it was it was always you know finding that horror movie on TV, um, you know, on cable on cable. Um, mm-hmm. But when it came time to like you know go out and rent movies or whatever, you know, she always, she was always there to like you know I was sort of a latchkey kid, um, so she. Mm-hmm. She gave me the card, and I would go to West Coast Video, and you know the the clerk always knew me, and and you know she 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 didn't think it was great, but she didn't like not let me do it, so you know it, right. I, I would just rent all these movies, and then she would find them, and and then she'd be like, "What the hell are you watching?" You know, and and then but and then she would end up watching it too, so it was kind of cool. I want to go on to Greg now. Greg Olheiser and his wife, Jill, have a business called Licks that sets up at horror conventions from coast to coast, specializing in horror-themed clothing. Now, if you've ever seen the booth set up for Licks, it's very visual, very theatrical. It almost feels like a cool sideshow devoted to horror movies is about to break out at any time. And... Greg has a list on his phone of movies as well. Uh, One of the things that when I first met him, we were sitting at a bar and he goes, oh, let me see if I've watched that movie. And he opened up his phone and he had a list, huge list of movies that he had seen. It's a very big list. And I was like, wow, this guy really knows his stuff. and He's seen quite a bit. So Greg, like I said, there's a theatricality to your booth, uh, the way you and your wife dress for the shows, the cookies that you give out. I mean, it feels like a real performance. Have you been a performer before? Is that something that really interests you? Um, well, I've done a little. Yeah, that's actually how I met my wife. I was doing some circusy things. And uh, so, yeah, I, it's funny that you say that. I've never really considered it to be much of a performance. But yeah, uh, I, yeah, sure. So, uh, do you uh, were you involved in the macabre uh, early on? In other words, it's not necessarily horror, but with circus sideshow and things like that is what it sounds like. Was that something that fascinated you early? Yeah, I, I think you know, like we're all kind of drawn to a lot of the you know a lot of the same things you'll see at the at the shows and and, and, and horror. You know, there's a lot of themes that we all enjoy. Obviously, uh, you know, as you say, the macabre. You know, magic is always exciting, and uh, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, uh, taxidermy, all that kind of stuff is kind of sideshow, all that stuff, uh, I think is are run in the same vein as everything we're all interested in, I suppose. Sure. What was it about horror that interested you so much that you're still, you know, you're going coast to coast and uh, selling uh, shirts that are based on it? Um, I, I, I've always loved, like, you know, I, I love, I just have a real love of, uh, uh, you know, monsters, I always, lo- you know, which is not a lot of monster movies anymore, it seems like, but I always love seeing monsters, and I, I just, I love gore. I think, um, you know, I always try to be a good person, or, you know, uh, look for the, do things that are good in the in the world and in life, and I think, uh, you know, there's that whole psychology of uh, a, a death instinct and a life instinct, and uh, 
I enjoy watch. You know, mm. I get I get that bad stuff out of the, you know, out of out of watching uh, out of watching movies. I mean, you know, seeing people get cut up or gored up or whatever. It's kind of a, not what you see. You, you look for, and I think a lot of times you look for in film what you don't find in your life. So, I think I like mm. to, maybe that's why. I don't know. Oh, that's very interesting. So, uh, what I want to do is uh, kind of open up the show now uh, to where we start to discuss some stuff. And of course, it is 2016, the end of 2016. It's the end of the year. Best of lists are coming out of everywhere. Now, horror in 2016 was, as always, a mixed bag. And I've seen even online horror sites lower their, their standards. In other words, they had a top 20 horror films of the year. and They're only doing a top 10 this year because they feel the picking was really slim now of course i think a lot of that's because there were big movies that got press like conjuring 2 the forest the boy don't breathe neon demon lights out the other side of the door and the witch and those were uh, there were a few standouts but for the most part they were pretty disappointing but i also think there were a lot of smaller movies that were really good uh, i am not a serial killer uh, the autopsy of jane doe the veil the invitation the monster uh baskin green room uh there's also some that i uh were so so but i still like some of their originality she who must burn uh the windmill uh so open question to you guys uh, what movies did you see this year that you thought were good enough that you'd recommend and greg why don't you start um i think for me the the top two the top two movies of this year were were definitely the witch and neon demon um you know, I, I, I love the, you know, the, um, the director's name escapes my mind right now of Neon Demon. He's he's just keeps coming out with one after another. I mean, he's a very beautiful visual director. He really, you know, you know, it, it just it's like watching a piece of art. You know, I mean, it's just incredible. And then but it's just has this building action. I think there's a lot there. And the soundtrack is amazing. Um, and then The Witch, uh, you know, I watched that one time and I thought it was a pretty solid movie watched it a second time and I just it was I just I really really hooked on that like uh it's it's those are the two best of the year um and the the child actor uh, the little boy and the witch is amazing oh yes one of the one of the one of an unbelievable scene if you want to see one of the best child actors in, in my opinion uh, the, there's a scene in the about maybe the middle of the film towards the later end of the film uh, just phenomenal so there's though both those movies I like a lot because they're really um you know, aesthetically pleasing. They're really enjoyable on a surface. And then as you think more and talk more, you know, we're all here talking about horror, you know, we talk in the lobbies and stuff about horror at uh, hotels and stuff. And, uh, and that's that, that those, those are the kind of things where somebody can tell you what they thought of the movie and they can describe something to you. And, and you'll say, Oh my God, you know, I, you know, I hadn't noticed that. And you'll, and you'll start to think more about it. And it's, it kind of rewards uh, conversation and thought. So I really enjoyed those two. Yeah, I, I felt the same about The Witch. I watched it a second time. What I think really makes that movie, uh, and there's a lot to be said for the photography and stuff, is really it's acted from top to bottom very, very well. Uh, everybody is committed to that movie and there's a really disturbing uh, sense of desperation in fact to a point where there uh, a friend of mine uh didn't look at it as a horror film at all she saw it as a psychological drama of a family slowly going insane uh, out at the edge of civilization that uh, all of the things that happen that seem supernatural uh could be playing in their heads and it was kind of interesting that she would say that and it was mainly because of the acting it was how people uh kept themselves grounded in reality uh, so uh, very cool that you talked about what your criteria is or what made these movies stand out brian how about you um i would echo greg's picks um i really love the witch uh the neon demon spoke to me um on an obvious level um the filmmaking was just amazing like a lot of people picked apart the neon demon because it was a lot of um just chaotic stuff that didn't quite make you know a lot of logical sense but i feel like pulling from a lot of italian cinema you know that's that's basically a lot of those films don't really make a lot of sense anyway but stylistically they're always so so great i, I would also add um like my personal films that i discovered in the past year um francesca um from the onetti brothers uh it's it's such a great callback to um, you know Italian seventies jolly, um, and, and mm -hmm. it really feels atmospherically like they they got everything correct you know in, in terms of just the look of the film and the sound of the film and 
it looks like they actually shot it in Italy. Um, you know, so it, it's it's a really great like if you love Jolly, I would recommend Francesca. Um, mm -hmm. And then the the invitation is another film um, yeah. that I, I I just don't see a lot of talk about it, and and it, it's just such a it's a film that really winds you up really really tight. And then the mm -hmm. ending, you know, which I won't spoil, but it's one of my favorite endings of, of the past couple of years in a horror film. And I, and I, I don't want to like get into too much here, but I, I would also add the eyes of my mother. I, I, I heard that you're not a huge fan of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 well, I'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, that, that one really spoke to me. It's a it's a great debut. Um, I think his name is Nicholas Pesci or something like that. Um, yes. But it's just, it's Nick his the first Fish. Film. Yeah. It's his first film. And just stylistically, it's just so, you know, there's a lot of amazing shots. You know, I, I look at the entire film. And I guess I'm looking at it now. Like, I, I watch films sort of as, like, you know, somebody that's making these things now. And, mm -hmm. and it was just such great direction, such great performances, in particular the main lead actress she she just blew me away you know and it's one of those films mm -hmm. that like takes a lot of these tropes that you usually see in a male driven film like a henry portrait of the serial killer or you know mm -hmm. things like that but instead it's a female and she's doing right. all these great things so I, I i really dug that film now i i really like the invitation karen kusama uh, it's like the first oh, movie yeah. she's made in a little bit and she was that's a fantastically directed film and uh what i uh, say about eyes of my mother is that i just felt that uh, stylistically no doubt that movie has style for eight films uh, but everything about it felt isolating uh, the black and white is isolating the sound is isolating uh they don't give you full motive uh, at different times, but I like some of the stuff that they're doing, which is a little bit Polanski, you know, kind of halfway letting you see what the action is, that yeah. liminal space. And that was really fun. But unfortunately, the movie in the end for me uh, felt uh, I didn't get the emotions that I look for in a horror film, you know, uh, or uh, emotions. I was in my head a lot. But yeah. I just didn't get that 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 grip. But I can completely understand how stylistically, and it does make me want to see what Pesky's going to do next because oh, yeah. I felt that that was a, an amazing debut. But this brings up something that's kind of interesting. One of the things that I'm seeing in recent horror films that I really like is this attention to tone that's happening. There's this dread, or whatever the tone is, they're really pulling pulling and stretching time through the film to really get people uncomfortable. So uh, things like The Witch, The Invitation, Autopsy of Jane Doe, which I really liked, uh, The Babadook, that's a year earlier, but still, uh, these movies all deal in that setup of a real sense of dread before going full horror. Now, do you guys feel that's valid? Do you think that you see that as well? Or are there any trends that you notice that you hope take off? Well, uh, I... I would agree. Um, I, I do. I can answer the the, the second the, your question there, but I'll, I'll um, sp speak to your your point first. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I I think that it seems to me that most movies that come out uh, nowadays, you know, and, you, and you're going to have obviously, you know, your your outriders, but it does seem like most horror, or I would say most, even most mainstream horror, um, and and yeah, probably mainstream. I always look at it in two different ways. There's mainstream horror, and then there's your, your, your independent horror. And I think that both seem to be going for, mm -hmm. yeah, like a really like attention to the tone is, is seems to come above all else. They seem to really set a stage, you know, and, and, and very, you know, slowly go through things, um, you know, over, I would say over action, over kills, over anything else. I mean, I think if you, well, one of the biggest ways people probably watch, um, you know, watch horror nowadays, I would say would probably be on streaming services like Netflix. And if you look at those movies that are on that mm -hmm. platform, you know, you're going to see, you, you, you know, most of them are not going to have like these big, you know, where you would watch a movie in the eighties and you could e easily say, Oh, Hey, you know, that scene where the guy just blows apart or the scene when they get knifed in the shower or whatever, you know, you can pick apart right. like four or five mo parts of a movie that you remember and you don't remember anything else from because it was inane dialogue, bad characters or whatever. But it seems like now, like movies on, on Netflix or, or anything, you know, like the movies that we've mentioned, they're more like a slow burn, you know, where there isn't like that big, you know, boom, that big effect or that big creature or what, what have you. So I, I, I would agree with the tone. 
part of that. Any other trends uh, yeah, that you feel? Uh, yeah, you know what's kind of interesting is that it seems like most to me it seems like all right. Number one, the biggest thing is is in this speaking to to you know John uh, in, in the soundtracks earlier. Um, it seems like everybody is synth, and I love I love 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 it. I absolutely love it. But it's it's kind of funny how almost every single movie that comes out in the past few years, all the biggest titles you can think of, independent wise. I'm talking independently now. I'm sorry. Uh, are all synth you know they're very 80s sounding soundtracks you know they sound like they're kind of trying to get that uh, mm. um john carpenter kind of feel right i will say that there there does feel like there's a, a john carpenter uh uh specter <laughs> floating over a lot of movies that are out there i think uh one of the things that you mentioned greg that was interesting uh was talking about how tone over even action i just watched uh, they look like people has anybody seen that? I heard of that one. Very, 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 very small movie. I think that Aaron Christensen had mentioned it in uh, in conversation. And so I watched this thing, and it is all slow burn. It's all, you know, this weird thing of is this guy uh, mentally ill or not. And I'm still not quite sure what I think of it uh, because it – goes all the way through the entire movie with this really, really crazy vibe. Uh, and in the very last couple seconds, I'm like, why don't you cut the camera? That should be the end right there, right there. And instead it goes on a little bit longer. But uh, uh, I, I think there's a couple of guys that I didn't talk to about what they thought might have been the best movies of the year. Uh, John, Damien, either of you have uh, favorites of this year? Um, I didn't get to see a, a lot of uh stuff out this year um i did i went to see mostly like the i guess the hollywood fluffier ones like 31 i said well that, not that wasn't mm. really hollywood fluff but it's fluff. Like 31 <laughs> uh conjuring to cotton uh, candy that out. movie yeah uh lights out um the, the disappointing blair witch project oh yeah yeah and really the only one i saw that i i thought was good this year uh that was new was uh the neon demon and like you were saying that was the only good one I would say I saw, and it was definitely a big slow burn. And everything else that Hollywood was putting out is like, you know, they're, they're trying to be atmospheric and, and build attention and stuff. But I just thought a lot of that stuff just didn't work, you know, especially stuff in The Conjuring 2. I thought The Conjuring was a really good film, and the second one was right. too unbelievable. You know, it, it just took me out of any kind of reality and just made it more like a, a Hollywood ghost story kind of thing. Yeah, Conjuring 2 suffered from what I thought a lot of 80s movies did, uh, the horror movies where it'd be like a guy would be holding on to a rope and then he would grab onto somebody and they're just hanging over some great chasm and somehow they're able to pull each other up and it's all just to extend the tension, but there's no yeah. tension because it's so unrealistic. Uh, and uh, I kind of felt that with Conjuring 2 towards the end. I was going, I see where you guys are going Let's speed this up because uh, I, I don't see any big surprises coming. But, uh, John, you mentioned something earlier when you were talking about TV, that TV was one of the big things for you, TV movies. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you got to see in the 70s that sometimes the bad guy doesn't get brought to justice. Sometimes bad things happen. They stay that way. And that's usually considered the the uh, ground zero of what's called the modern horror film. So we're coming up to about 50 years of what uh, is arguably considered the first movie that is purely uh, the modern horror, and that's Night of the Living Dead. Uh, now, we had uh, a lot of directors and creativity that happened all at that time. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, the movies that we remember uh, and that were uh, excited by happened when we were young and we saw these movies that were so different from what we may have seen before. Like I had seen, you know, movies from the 30s and the 40s and then there was that kind of thing and it was kind of surprising. So it was really a rush of creativity at that time. Do you feel uh, that there are directors now, whether they put out a movie this year or last year or not, John, do you think there's some directors that we really should be watching because you think that they've got their hand on the ball um yeah i think um the as brian mentioned with that movie francesca the onetti brothers um what they're doing with hardly any money um i thought was incredible with that film um there's uh, james ward burkett who did coherence mm. uh, i mean he made that with no money and i think it just turned out to be an amazing film and then you have uh, 
let's see, Jim Mickle, who's been doing a lot of stuff yes. with Larry Fessenden. Um, I haven't seen anything of his that I did not just love. Um, and then uh, Robert Eggers, who did uh, The Witch. So mm -hmm. I, I do think, but I think what you'll notice in all these films is they're not Hollywood films. They're, right. all, they're all independent, low budget. And I think that's the real, um, where the spotlight should be on is these guys are not being told what to do by five different production companies. They're making the film that they want to make. Um, and I think that's really where the talent's showing through. Because I think when you get too many people pointing fingers at what, you know, what you got to have this in a movie and you got to have this, then it just becomes muddled and, you know, becomes conjuring too. Right. And I think uh, you said something there that's kind of interesting, that they're all independents. And I, uh, one of the things was, say, looking back 40 years ago, uh, the movies that were big uh, 40 years ago, I mean, there was The Omen and there was Carrie and uh, a few other large ones. King Kong, I think, was mentioned. Uh, but most of those movies were small independents. The Town That Dreaded Sundown, uh, Eaten Alive, the, the Witch Who Came Out of the Sea. Thank you very much, John, for uh, telling me about that one. I'd never seen seen it uh freaks uh grizzly squirm burnt offerings alice sweet alice uh do you think that um uh, streaming is the new drive-in where these movies can survive and become something big i i think the yes it had i mean obviously it's so much easier to get a market to or to get your film into the market but i think the problem is there's so many that mm -hmm. it's so easy to get lost uh, in the hundreds of other titles that are trying to buy your attention as well. The drive-in, I mean, it's the same theory, but the drive-in was a much smaller market. You had so many lesser films coming out. Um, so at least you get your film out there and people would see it. But with streaming, unless, you know, by word of mouth it picks up, you're one of, you know, a thousand films out there that are trying to get somebody's attention. What was the last movie uh, that surprised you? Uh, let's talk, uh, Greg. What was the last movie that surprised you? Was it in the theater, or did you see it on streaming um, or man, DVD? Uh, I have to. I guess I don't get <laughs> surprise. Yeah, you know, it's kind of I get a surprise very often. Yeah, hey, I don't, I don't, how about a bad uh, surprise? Kind of, I hated I, that. You know, I that I can't really answer that question that well, but I, in, in terms of an exact thing, but I can say that. It's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, I watched a lot. Of, I would do watch a lot of movies. I watch a, I watched almost 400 last year, like over 300 this year, um, you know, and, and I, I find it, you know, I find those tropes so easily. You know, I see something and I just, you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to find something new, mm -hmm. you know, for me. So I I'm always uh, I'm always very, very excited to see something that I haven't seen before. And I always give a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of credit to a movie where I'm like, wow, well, that's not something I'd, uh, I'd really seen before. Like there was this, uh, this year was, um, I don't think you could really classify this as horror, but maybe, um, the, the Daniel Radcliffe one, um, uh, where he's the dead body, um, Swiss army, man. Swiss army. Oh yeah. I guess that Swiss was the army biggest man. surprise I had in a way, because I, you know, that's, I'd never seen that before. And I, and although I, I didn't think it was an overly successful movie, it did hold my attention, but it wasn't as amazing as I was hoping. Um, I, I give that movie, an unbelievable amount of credit for you know doing something totally totally different that hasn't been seen before because at this point it's a very you know you're seeing a lot of the same stuff over and over again um i do gotta i have to say um you mentioned it before and <clears throat> i didn't really put it on my list of uh you know top five or whatever but it, I, if i had a top 10 it would definitely make my list um the autopsy of jane doe um mm -hmm. I, I watched that the other night and and you know, I took um, the advice of the internet um, to like not watch any trailers and not go into it knowing much about it, and mm -hmm. it just unraveled as like a really great like mystery. Um, and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but it's got a lot of those elements that I, you know, I wasn't expecting. And you know, um, just going into it with the um, the summary of it just being, you know, these two people that are doing an autopsy on this mysterious corpse um everything else that unraveled in that movie was was a you know and it had a lot of the same tropes that you see in other films but i just felt it to be a really great surprise in terms of it unraveling all that stuff so um yeah. and and i heard it I was thought, great i 
good movie. Um, so I, I went into it with some expectations, but just those mysteries alone, just I, I felt that was a, a nice little surprise because I don't really get yeah. that. I, I was pretty impressed by it too, and I was surprised. Uh, I watched it because someone had uh, given me a suggestion to do so. Same thing. Don't read up on it. Don't look at anything. I, yeah. I knew that it was the director of Troll Hunter. That made me think of a whole yeah. different movie than what I got, which was actually kind of cool. Uh, it really, it's so low budget. It's only a yeah. few sets, but it's, once again, so well acted, uh, and visually, it's just rich. And I liked it because even though there's this Gru to it, uh, it's an autopsy, folks. Right. Uh, there's a very ghost story feel to it, and there's ghost story visuals. They don't yes. show you everything, and sound is important to the film. So I really oh, yeah. did appreciate that as well. And, uh, and so I do have to all say, of them. I do have mm -hmm. to say that um, I heard that the the remake for Troll Hunter fell through, so that that really makes me happy. Hey Scott, Good can I know. have something? Please. <laughs> um, I, I have to say that one of the things that surprised me is usually when I do my year in like top 10 films, mm -hmm. like Damien had mentioned, most of what I usually watch is decades old. Um, mm -hmm. I still can, if it's a first time view, I consider it in my top 10 list. But this year, most of my films were actually made um, in the last two or three years. And that hasn't happened since I started keeping track of this stuff. Um, hmm. You mentioned before, I am a serial killer, or I'm sorry, yes. I am not a serial killer. Right. Is big difference. Um, <laughs> is really, really well done. Um, the one Francesca that Brian mentioned. Um, also, I think 10 Cloverfield Lane, which, mm. is a, oh, yeah. which, which is a Hollywood film, I think was really, really well done. Um, and it's kind of funny to note that both that film and I am not a serial killer feature two main actors that are known for their comedic roles. Yes. But are scary as hell in these. Yeah. Um, and then another one, I think it was from a couple of years ago, uh, a film called When Animals Dream. Yes. I is, have not seen that. It is a, it's really well done. It's really, really good. Um, and the funny thing is, is one that would have been on my list last year was Bone Tomahawk. Oh, I love Bone Tomahawk. I literally watched it on New Year's Day last year. <laughs> and it's like, son of a bitch, if I had watched that a day earlier, it would have been on last year's list. But that film is, it was amazing, too. The performances yeah. in there are just incredible. Oh, yeah. The performances, talk about a surprise, having no idea what I was walking into. Yeah. Uh, that movie has so much humor. Uh, the acting, Richard Jenkins is absolutely fantastic in he that movie. He definitely stole the, stole the show in that. Although, yeah. Kurt Russell, again, how badass is Kurt oh, Russell? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you couldn't ask for a better part. And he can work with whoever he wants to at this point. In fact, he doesn't work unless he uh, gets called by Quentin Tarantino for the most part at this juncture. But uh, he went for this role. And that movie was made for like $800,000, some ridiculously small amount of money. Almost impossible. The movie is over two hours long. Just in film stock, it would cost $800,000. No, it was one eight, one point eight million million, which is nothing. Uh, and... And it's a period piece. It's got name actors, and yeah. it's over two and a half, almost two and a half hours long. And it was made on the low budget, and it was made by a first-time director uh, who was a writer. And he made that movie because uh, he had this horrible tragedy where I believe his family was killed. Oh, wow. and uh, it was how he wrote his way out which uh, is uh, really interesting. That kind of begs another question. When I talk about horror, you know, we're longtime viewers, uh, and we get something out of horror films that keeps us watching. Uh, what do you think it is that you respond to so intensely? And, and, and do you think that there's ever a time when it's therapeutic? I definitely think it's therapeutic, but I, I think, for me, one of the benefits, or one of the things I like about the horror genre is you get to see stuff that's different. Filmmakers mm -hmm. are not a, afraid to take chances. Um, I think they're allowed to do more stuff because it is a horror film. And for the most part in society, it's not taken seriously. Um, there's a, a, a quote I remember from uh, Cameron Mitchell, who played in everything from, I mean, he was in Mario Bottomo mm -hmm. films. Yep. And later on in his life, he played Prowler. in a lot of 
really bad films. But he had said that he loved doing these kind of films because he was allowed to experiment and try things that you couldn't do in a big Hollywood film. So that's why he would play in pieces of crap like Frankenstein Island, but he could do whatever he wanted to. He could experiment, and that was a true acting form. So I think that's in horror films, you get that. You get people trying to do something that's not normal, that's not the ordinary or the everyday. Right. And Damien, uh, I know that, uh, first off, one of the things that I really uh, responded to when I first met it was your sense of humor. And uh, do you feel uh, that there's uh, a place for humor in horror? We're talking about, like, what do you respond to? And for some reason, I think that you respond not only to the horror, but also the humor. It's, it's funny that you say that because uh, I think humor in horror is a very fine line and very few times mm-hmm. is, it, is it done right. You know, but as far as like um, one of my biggest pet peeves with with horror films and and, you know, any kind of movies. But like uh, if you're going to see like an older film, um, Mm -hmm. like, you know, you're going to see like uh, like the Corpse Grinders or something like that. And and you're sitting in a theater with people and they're all having a good time and laughing and stuff. That drives me up the wall because that movie wasn't I mean, it's, it's a silly movie, but it was never it's not a comedy. You know, it wasn't made as a comedy. And, like, so many, like, older, you know, horror films and stuff that people laugh at because, you know, oh, it's so cheap or the acting's so bad or something like that. It, it drives me up the wall because I don't find any of that humorous. I take that all seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just – it just I hate I hate how people make fun of uh, the older films or the cheaper films or European films just because they didn't have a budget or, or the, the makeup's bad or the acting's so the- poor or – you're not a fan of the camp. I, I mean, I love campy movies, and I and I, I understand them, but to, to to like them because they're funny or so stupid that I don't like. I like them, you know, right. for the reasons that they were meant, you know, to be. I mean, they were meant to be scary films, and and I appreciate them for that. I don't I don't like those kind of movies because they're so goofy or something like that, you know. Yeah, it's a very small list for me of horror and humor when they work together. I mean, really, the, the, the top of the mountain to me is American Werewolf in London because it is genuinely funny at times, but when it decides to be scary it really does deliver the goods with some great visuals and things like that. Uh, Feast would be another one that I really thought was great, uh, even though it might be a little bit too jokey, but I just loved how it pressed the buttons of uh, my expectations on the genre uh, and doing it in a way that was still kind of disturbing at certain points. There's really a, but, uh, not, not much of a difference between comedy and horror because no. they're both trying to get a very strong emotion out of you that's very difficult to get out of you, you know, it's, it's hard yeah. to scare you. And it's all and it's hard to make you laugh. Uh, yeah. well, so they're really not right. that different of movies, but when you combine them together, I think they, they rarely work. Yeah. So perfect time to dovetail since uh, we're talking about comedy. Uh, John, you do Turkey day. Now, can you explain what Turkey day is? Well, uh, years and years ago, uh, when mystery science theater was still on comedy central, they, uh, I think this was in the early 90s, on the Friday after Thanksgiving, or it might have even been on Thanksgiving, they would show 24 hours of, of MST, and they would call it their Turkey Day Marathon. So in 2003, I decided, mainly because I did not want to be out shopping on uh, Black Friday, <laughs> I decided that I was going to spend Black Friday sitting watching some of the son of what I call cinematics ship, uh, cinematic shipwrecks, um, mm-hmm. some of the finest in bad cinema, or just what I call turkeys. Um, so I did it the first two years by myself, which I would not recommend. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Aaron Christensen started coming along, and he's been to one, he's been to two of them all ever since, and that was, like I said, 2003, 2005 when he started. Um, and now we do it twice a year. And we usually have anywhere from four to shoot 15 people. And it's we usually get through seven movies. And it's just some of cinemas, you know, they're not low. They're not big budgeted. They're like Damien mentioned, these guys were with had a low budget and they tried their hardest. Sometimes they just failed. 
Um, and, and we don't make fun of these while there is laughing. I, I, I will say we, there is a lot of laughing going on, but it's just at the, the time frame that they were made, um, which are, were not humorous back then, but now they, they seem funny. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the dialogue, uh, but again, we're not making fun of them. It's just an appreciation of these guys that were putting their heart into these films. Um, it is an acquired taste, but, uh, yeah, we've been doing it ever since then and we have a blast so obviously we don't like bad horror movies but then again we do (laughs) case in point is what we have in turkey day so what do you guys think makes a movie worth watching on a turkey day what what is it that you go well i give this a pass or i at least will watch it well a good example is a lot of the stuff from the 50s the sci-fi horror um a lot of the science in there is oh god yeah is ridiculous so when you now again back at that time period nobody's questioning you know radiation can be stopped by just putting it in a tub of water um but when you watch it these days some of the science talk is just it's a riot um some of the costumes that they come up for the creatures again they were mm-hmm. they had no money um, but this is what they came up for. And I give them so much respect for what they had to do with what they had. Um, it's just, it's a lot of fun. You enjoy seeing this stuff. Um, granted it's 50, 60 years later, but it's just, it's a riot. Um, so, I mean, what I look for is a uh, bad dialogue or just, you know, well, yeah, bad dialogue, um, where the acting is not professional as you would typically get. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's certain directors that, that are always go to, like, uh, one of Damien's favorites. I know, <laughs> I know Al exactly Adamson. <laughs> Al Adamson. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you, when you, when you talk about, you know, bad filmmakers and I know Al, Al Adamson gets, uh, a lot of bad rap for that. But when you look at it at a business side, that guy was making money with, or making films with no money and his films played in, in drive-ins and he made money. So right. he, he he was a good good filmmaker. He wasn't a good craftsmanship filmmaker. Right, right. But you watch some of his stuff and you just sit there and shake your head going, Who's who whose idea was this? How did this right. you know, at one point did this get a green light to someone that goes, I love that. Let's put it in the movie. So yeah. but there's other people like um Larry Buchanan's another good one. There's a lot of Jess Franco films that are Turkey Day oh, fodder. Yeah. Um, How about Raw Force? <laughs> that actually we watched a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Starring, I um, was yeah. I think Cameron Mitchell was in that as well. I, I believe. believe he's yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. <laughs> There's so. so much amazing in that film. All I remember is the. Uh, after all the insanity that's happened in that movie, there's a beheading with a samurai sword that when it comes up into frame is bent like an L. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I just, oh man, that movie just kills me. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk with Greg real quick about, because you've watched so many m- movies per year and we've just come through what might finally be ending, which is the remake uh, grist for the mill. Every movie was being remade. However, I think that there were some really good remakes. Uh, do you think that there were any good remakes? What ones stood out to you? <laughs> it's funny that you asked that because, uh, uh, you know, uh, John and I always have this big thing about remakes. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of them. I, I've always kind of railed against them. Um, I don't generally go to see them, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I understand why they're there. Um, it kind of like, um, stopped hating on them, I guess, uh, uh, you know, but I, 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 I don't generally see them. So it's a, it's a, it's a good question, but I can't really, uh, I, I, I have a hard time answering that. Um, although I guess since this is just a discussion, I will say, uh, John and I all oftentimes talk about, you know, remakes and, and, uh, and, and if they should be made or not. And, and he actually had changed my mind on something and now I've kind of come to accept them and think that, you know, um, you know, not everybody has the same experience. You know, we, uh, you, you and I watch a movie um, under totally different circumstances, you know, and totally different times in our life. And you have a totally different take than another person. Mm-hmm. It's a very organic experience. And uh, not everybody has had those same experiences that you have had in your life. And the, and these are their introductions to those to those movies. So I 
I get why they're made. I'm, I, you know, I don't run out to see them. I, I just, I just don't. Yeah. Well, uh, what I think is really interesting is that so many of us have a a, a, a bad feeling about remakes. Yet many of the seminal films from our childhood are remakes, and uh, some of them that were really good and really changed uh, the way that horror went. Uh, Brian, do you have any uh, remakes that you would recommend? Um, you know. Remakes are funny because it, in in a way, it, it walks that you know that double edged sword of like, you know, you're you're treading on this classic territory, and but at the same time you're trying to do something new with it. You know, like like when I watched uh, Maniac, I mm-hmm. I, you know, I I didn't have, I, I wasn't obsessed with the the original film. I really dug it. You know, but mm-hmm. I, I just. Like, I, it, it's not demons level for me, you know? Um, so when I went into the remake, you know, I just, in my head, I was like, well, I, I have the older one in case this one sucks. But I was actually really floored by that one. I love the filmmaking. Um, I think uh, Alexandra Aja um, produced mm-hmm. it or something. Um, and it was just such a, it was a good film. And, and it had a different take in terms of the POV thing. Um, you know, a lot of great gore and, uh, and just really good storytelling. And I think at the end of the day, you know, you don't need to remake like something like Let the Right One In or Troll Hunter or whatever. You don't need to make remake mm-hmm. those because like for, okay, here's, here's um, something that I'm kind of weary about because you have great talent behind it, but yet it's a remake. Um, uh, what's his name? The, the guy that just, uh, that made the, um, that Blair Witch movie that just came out. Uh, oh, um, Wingard. Yeah, he he's doing um, the uh, uh, I saw the devil remake. Oh my god! Um, yeah, and, no, and, no, and no. Like I, <laughs> like I, I think he's a super talented <laughs> filmmaker, but it's like to me, I saw the devil is one of the most perfect films that I've seen in the last decade, and and to retread that, like I don't know, I just I I would find it daunting as a filmmaker to even try to touch something like that you know well it, it's so idiosyncratic that film that i don't yeah. quite understand how they're going to be able to do that tone it's like a one off there are right. some movies that are just like them when they try to uh, and they can't be like martyrs <laughs> oh, oh my, my god. god yeah please can't oh, please <laughs> Yeah, shoot me now. That was so bad. Now, the one that really surprised me, and I think may be the best modern remake, uh, is Town That Dreaded Sundown. I really felt that that was a movie that loved. Most remakes don't love the source material, or they're trying to really make something else out of it. But this movie... uh, really had to love the first movie to actually exist in that meta fashion that it does. And it not only talks about the movie, but it talks about the actual factual murders and the incongruencies between them and brings in some of the, uh, the lesser known uh, conspiracy theories of who might have been the killer. And it is a good scary movie in and of itself. It still has the set pieces, but it's pretty powerful. I was really surprised at how uh, aggressively violent the movie was in its update, and it had a sense of humor all the way through as well. But I was really, really impressed that somebody took something that, I mean, the movie itself is fun, but it's not anything like what came out of that uh that remake uh, of course the remake could have never existed without the first one so it's really an interesting thing i think in one way that makes it the perfect remake it can't survive on its own yet it's such a uh, uh an increase uh of uh the story in its own way uh from the original now, uh, how now about- if, if i could add something to that yeah. um because you that that's another great example of a good remake um, but you also walk that fine line of if you're a fan of the original film and you're just trying to give the original film the respect, sometimes it can kind of come off as like a fan film. You know what I mean? Like, like you, right. You're kind of seeing that with Star Wars now. And, you know, don't get me started. I love Star Wars, but a lot of times it feels like it's like a fan film rather than its own, you know, right. particular film, you know. And, and sometimes remakes or remakes sort of tread that sort of water where it's like, you know, is, is this something that's original? Is Are they trying to do something else or or is it right. like 
you know, a fan film. Like, it, it, I, I honestly think that sequels are more susceptible to that than even remakes. Most of the time remakes, well, first off, there's so many remakes now uh, that kind of takes it out of the, the equation. But there was a time when remakes, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, were uh, not as often happening. And they were trying to do something a little bit different. The people who were the directors were. But I always saw sequels. By the time you got to like, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and any of the Freddy's or not Freddy's, the, the adjacent movies, they were kind of like fan films. They went yeah. straight to the, the cheese and, and yeah. whatever anybody was feeling was tasty. Um, so how about Damien? What's the one horror movie or horror subgenre that you never got and you just don't know why everybody goes crazy for it? Uh, all the Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers films, I don't <laughs> understand them at all. I, I'm just not a fan of that whole iconic slasher character uh, movie, and it, it makes no sense to me. Like, and you're you know the rooting, cheering for the bad guy with the most kills, and you know Freddy's like a talk show host in him. It's just like I don't you know all all the the first ones of all of them are all great movies, and then immediately they became so formulaic and and falling downhill. I, I just never understood that genre and, and the fact that you're taking like, you know, child molesters and like mask murderers and stuff like that. And they're put on like uh, pedestals, like iconic heroes. Like it, it's such a bizarre thing. I, I never understood any of those uh, types of movies at all. Yeah. I've always had a problem with the slasher. I thought that the slasher was going to be like revolutionary. I remember when MTV first came out, all the critics said, this is going to revolutionize film here. We're going to have three minute movies full of great expression and they can be anything. And then they turned terribly commercial within a year, I think. And the same thing happened to me with slashers. When I first saw like Friday the 13th is what I consider the first slasher. I don't really consider Halloween a slasher film in its own in its own way but uh, uh i thought this is pink punk rock man yeah what black about christmas would you consider that like oh black christmas yeah oh i i i guess it can be considered a, a slasher i know that it's considered the blueprint that everybody the template for the slasher film it's because it's so originally its own thing i never really thought of it in those terms but i can see how someone could i think the big difference is i don't think you're ever rooting for billy at all and billy is kept from almost being human you know he's a human being because you've seen him climb up the trellis but there's this whole thing of never seeing him never allowing him any kind of backstory and never even getting caught that he almost feels kind of like for me, Michael Myers and Halloween. They almost don't seem like human beings anymore, but in a really interesting way, not like, oh, he gets shot 17 times and he gets up right. just because that's the way these movies go. That's the way they but I thought be. that they were going to be, yeah, I always thought that they were going to be really exciting, but then it really became very rote, uh, the slasher film to me. But anyway, that's a ton of my opinion. How about, uh, 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 Greg, how about you? What horror movie subgenre did you never get? And you don't know why everybody's nuts for it. Honestly, the, the again, the, the slasher genres, I, I hate to just mimic what, what just being said, but I, yeah, I mean like there's, I love seeing the kills if there's some really good kills, but I, I never understood the, 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 the part of that, the, the sub genre, that sub genre that, you know, you have these movies, you know, like, like prom night. I never got that. It's like, you, you know, and uh, it's like, the whole point of these is for me is to see these kills and you, you know, you, you watch like a movie like that and they cut out the kills. And I, I don't know. I just never really got that. And then, you know, and there's a lot of them in that, in that, in the slasher genre that it's, it seems like the movie is just built on like, there's a bunch of kills. And then a lot of those, a lot of those movies kind of like just yank out the kills and they just show the ax falling or whatever. And then it's cut, you know, and, and there are such copycats of each other. They, they really get pretty dry, pretty fast. Um, the uh um you know and, and and what's interesting about that genre too is you can almost like in, in no other really genre of film can you remove a remove a scene and have a movie work i mean every dialogue line of dialogue every scene is important or it wouldn't be in the movie but mm -hmm. like it seems almost like a lot of the, the slasher genre you can almost remove entire scenes and then and you will have the same <laughs> the same movie 
to an effect, you know, <laughs> I, you know, right. so there are some gems in that genre like any, but I think that there's a lot of, a lot of duds in that genre as well. Right. Right. Now, one of the things that, uh, we've talked about, uh, where we're, we're talking about movies that we think are above the normal grade, the ones that we have been surprised by, uh, a lot of those, we mention the acting again and again, bone tomahawk and, uh, the autopsy of Jane Doe acting, uh, is so key to these movies, even though it usually gets a bad rap. Best actors in horror. Uh, let's have a lightning round. Performances that deserve to be noticed but weren't. Uh, John, why don't you start? Are you talking current or just in general? In general. Uh, well, I Jill Larson from The take, Taking of Deborah Logan, mm-hmm. I, I thought was oh, just un, unbelievable. Yeah. And this actress was in her, I think, late 60s. Yeah. And yeah, she was an amazing, amazing. Um, Scared the hell you, out of me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's real. And I hate first camera or first person, the shaky cam. Right. And I didn't watch it when it first came out because of that reason. But uh, what she put herself through for that film is just unbelievable. Just the yeah. stills of her. Just if you look at just her face and any of those, you know, like it's yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, th- there's sequences where she does nothing other than just stare at the camera that mm-hmm. is chilling and one of the uh, yeah. and endings. it's not one note yeah oh, that, that well, a great ending. Ending. and she's not one note what's great is that they set up the idea of alzheimer's or dementia in the beginning and so she has to play at first someone who is hiding how bad things are right and that very strange thing of like, oh, well, I knew that, you know, that odd. If you've ever been around someone with dementia, there's this really off putting thing of where you think everything's absolutely great. And then all of a sudden it's not. And she was able to pull that kind of weird innocence that's not innocent at all. She's actually hiding everything uh, and then turn it inside out to what it turns into yeah. at the end. I mean, it was really a, an amazing performance and even I- physically how she changed. I, I really thought she had the uh, the Oscar for it. Oh, wait a minute. She wasn't nominated. No, 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 no. Uh, I also give Jennifer Carpenter for uh, the possession of Emily Rose. Yes. Uh, there's, there's just something about the way that she... Uh, there's a, a slow simmer burn in that movie as well as really big over-the-top stuff. And uh, I think that could be a silent film with her. She Everything's coming out of her face. It's amazing. Yeah. How about you, Greg? Any that just stick out? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think um, the Babadook, both mm. the mother, S.C. Davis, her name off the top of my head, or the yeah, and then and the child in that also. I mean, they're both incredible. I mean, they make that movie. You know, it, some of the best horror of the last few years, I think, is you know, uh, just you know, Babadook is one of them. Neon Demon, the Witch, and they all have incredible performances yeah. you know and, and and then to throw in there it follows which i don't think was on par in terms of i mean it was well acted but i don't think it was noteworthy well acted but it's interesting too that those are all female right. you know a lot very female driven movies and, and spots which is kind of interesting but yeah she's an unbelievable i mean they both are unbelievable you know like you really you really feel for her you know and 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 she's you know you can see all that range of emotion and and the regret about the child and you know and then you had said before about you know you could look at um you know the witch and say that it wasn't a you know that it maybe there was nothing supernatural there your friend was saying and i think you could look at it the same way with the baba mm. duck that maybe there was nothing supernatural there either and i think that kind of dovetails what we were talking about before about how i like those movies because you can you will get those other viewpoints from other people because i hadn't thought about that for the witch and that's really interesting and then and and both of their performances, you know, the whole movie, you know, you get through half of the movie and 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 you're hooked. I mean, I was totally hooked on yeah. that movie because of their because of how good they, that those characters were. And I didn't even need anything you know, else to happen. And then when it starts to happen, it's just it's just great. Yeah, so. there's such an unsteady tension in that film. It's just like uh, the Babadook has it's it's directed by a woman and there's a tension that I I, I don't want to say that only a woman could do, but there's something there about how that relationship is with the child. So case in point, when I've talked to people about the Babadook, nine out of 10 times, if they don't like the movie, it's a guy saying, I get it already. The kid's irritating. The kid's irritating. Stop showing me the kids being irritating. The scene, but yeah. that's the point, right? 
you can't. Uh, I didn't mean to step on you. No, go um, right ahead. Yeah, the opening scene is. I mean, you see, the, it was one of the most effective shots I've ever seen in a movie to to use. You know, film is supposed to show you things and not supposed to tell you things, right? And when you see this opening scene and you see right. the mother is, and for those who haven't seen the movie, it's not really giving it anything away. It's just an opening scene here. Uh, she is laying on one side of the bed and she's staring off that, that side of the bed, you know. Uh, they're supposed to be asleep and the, and the child is across the bed facing the other direction, you know, and there's this gulf between them. And I mean, that there is an amazing visual because you see that that is just a, a metaphor for their entire lives. And this, there's a scene when he's on top of that. Well, there's a swing set scene where, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just absolutely insane. And and he mm-hmm. even looks right. like, well, I'll, I'll leave that to the, to the viewer for later. So not to give too much away spoilers. Yeah. Brian, do you have any? I would say Alexandra Esso from Starry Eyes. Um, oh, wow. Yes. Her. She deserved like some kind of an award for her performance because she put everything out there in, in that, you know, and it's it's one of those like, um, you know, searching for something bigger than you are kind of roles, and it just hits so many different levels. And oh my Another god, I, I was just blown away by by her performance. Yeah, yeah, and and I, honestly, I think there's something to that. I, I feel like these female-driven um, personal horror stories, like it, it becomes a, a sort of personal you know journey, and I think it, it can only be done. By a female side, you know, like the, the, you you have the males side of the storytelling, but I feel like these are specifically, you know, because females, I you know, and I, I feel weird for saying this, but I feel like if you're a female, you're going through all these different like body horror kind of things anyway, and and you you're going through so many different emotions and so many levels of how you perceive certain things, and a man is a very like caveman kind of thing. You know where it's like, um, like I, I feel like um, that's, like that's a drop off. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm totally yeah. a caveman. Bunch, but, of, bunch like, of knuckle draggers here. <laughs> but I, I feel like um, the Babadook would have been a totally different movie had it been a male lead. You know, and, and you know, a single parent dealing with his son or whatever. You know, and, and it's a different take. But I, I feel like it's just more. Um, you know, because like. And not to sound like sexist or whatever, but it's always been a trope where females have sort of been like looked at as more vulnerable in a horror film. And it's only lately where you see things like You're Next and and um, I'll even throw in Hush, uh, you know, from this past year. Right, right. Where, where they're like, oh, my God, like they're the ones not to be fucked with in this movie, you know. And, mm-hmm. and in Starry Eyes, I feel like Alexandra Esso, she's like at the end of the movie she's a monster you know she's just this crazy yeah like you're scared of this person and or rather you're scared of this thing it's not necessarily female or male anymore this is a a, a monster and you're scared of this thing so i, I just think it's a it's a powerful yeah. yeah that's a very interesting point especially what you said about baba duke it would be a completely different film if it was male and i don't think it's just about uh masculinity or anything i think it's a mindset a way of thinking around things and what i mean by that is if it's a, a guy in that situation he's trying to solve the problem uh we got to fix the kid we got to do this we got to do that but in uh, with the woman in this it's kind of as if she has to deal with things not being able to change how am i going to deal with things having to be this way now this is the new normal my kid's nuts you know and i can't leave the kid and i'm stuck here and i'm gonna be this person there's uh almost a compromise in fact i think that i'm not going to say anything more about the babadoo but there it seems to be a sense of compromise that needs to be found in that film for there to be a resolution as opposed to we got to solve the case. We got to get the cursed item and throw it into the ocean or whatever it might be. It's not an action thing. It's like, I have to sit in this world. Right. How do I cope with sitting in this world? And that's not an action thing that you normally would have in a, in a, a movie with a male character who needs to figure out the answer. There's the, the and I think that's why the tension is so, uh, aggravating to some people how that kid just keeps going off and off and off and it's kind of like rubbing your your nose in it uh anyway i know that i've kept you guys uh, a good long time here and i want to thank you all before we leave though uh because we've got these 
great guys who just have a wonderful philosophy about horror. They've seen so many different movies. I'd like you to tell us what movies we should be watching that we haven't. Any time period. Uh, keep it down to 10. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny, you know, and I'm sure you guys probably go through the same thing because you're all uh, into horror so much. When other, like, maybe non-horror related people ask you, like, you know, what's what's good horror movie? I haven't seen a good horror movie in, in so long. And it's, you know, I think there's still a lot. I think every year there's great horror movies still coming out. Yes. And people are just not searching. You have to search for them now to find them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think people are just looking at, like, the popcorn Hollywood horror, and they all mostly suck. And that's what people think of horror. They're like, oh, I haven't seen, you know, because they're not seeing good Hollywood movies. They just think that there's no good horror anymore. But there's so much good horror stuff produced or you know every year is still coming out like i said you just have to search for it you know like recently you know the Baba Duke, i think was probably the last movie i saw that just blew me away completely but uh, you know Baba Duke, starry eyes neon demons all recently just great great horror movies of course you know the best stuff is still coming <laughs> from the 70s and 80s that'll right. that'll never change <laughs> <laughs> but it's like i think i remember being at a convention uh one time and this I overheard this people talking at the uh, table next to me and this, you know, it's like the typical older guy in his like Frankenstein shirt and he was talking to a vendor and the vendor mentioned some movie I forget. And the guy was like, Oh, you know, I only watch like, you know, classic horror movies. I don't watch any of that new stuff. And I was like, that is a goddamn shame because there is so much good horror out there. And why would you confine yourself to such a small, uh, you know, point of it? You know, I, I love horror everything and not even movies literature or everything to want to just narrow my mind into just like you know one uh genre is is crazy i mean right. of course i have my favorites you know i love all the the sleaze and euro trash and and exploitation <laughs> from the 60s 70s and 80s but it doesn't mean i don't like new movies coming out today can i know? add something real quick to that it, it's it, right it's funny damien mentioned sure. it because i've i mean we i think all of us have run into that same person, uh, figure, you know, me- metaphor. No, no, just <laughs> no, metaphorically. You know who I'm talking about that, right? But the funny, the funny thing is, <laughs> right, is I've right. run into the exact opposite, where you run into someone that, God forbid, if you, you ask them to watch a black and white movie, or, what, what are you kidding? So oh, yeah. it, it does go from both sides. But a new movie is a new movie, whether it came out this year or 50 years ago. So there's, like Damien said, all you got to do is look. And you'll never run out of good stuff. It's like, remember when you were first getting into things, you know, what got you into horror, what got you into like music and stuff is, is discovering something new. And that, that new discovery was such a great feeling, you know, it just blew your mind because this was something new to you. That's what like, I think searching, finding, it doesn't even have to be a new movie, just like anything you haven't seen before that blows your mind. It, it's it's that experience of that new experience. Yeah. Something new is, is the best part. So what movies should we be watching, John, that we um, haven't any time oh, period? There's a, uh, a Norwegian film called The Wave. It's not technically horror, but it's, mm. it's just basically mm-hmm. a disaster film that is really well done. Um, Southbound is a, a, a low-budget um, anthology film that's actually mm-hmm. pretty good that I would recommend. Um, Honeymoon... Speaking of, of strong female leads, uh, Rose yeah. Leslie is just incredible in there. Uh, that one's mm-hmm. really well done. Oh, geez. Uh, Coherence, I've been waving that flag for a while, I think I, is amazing. I would agree with you on that um, one. One of the best movies of that year. Yeah. And even just if you go back older, um, I, I think, as Damien mentioned, if you don't limit yourself and you just keep looking beyond, you're gonna you're still going to find amazing stuff. Um Anthony Hopkins and, and Magic. I still think Magic is just an incredible film. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, yeah, there's there's ton of stuff. You just need to look for it and be open um, for different kinds of films because there's a ton of stuff out there. Yeah. Greg, how about you? Uh, actually, you know, this will this kind of, you know, goes along with what we were talking about in a couple of things. When you were talking about the remakes with um, mm-hmm. Town of the Dreaded Sundown, which is you know, to me is its own movie that kind of exists on that. And I, I like this throwback thing. And there's a director that I, uh, he has a movie, that new movie this year that 
uh, I enjoyed, and he only has one other, and it kind of like, um, it, you know, it stays in that what I was talking about before, where it's you know the synth soundtrack, you know, and and it's and it's and it feels like they're he's remaking these movies, and it's also, you know, you get the old throwback posters, like the beautiful art posters, and Joe Bagos, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he's got Mind's Eye yeah. for this year, and uh, I just saw Almost Human, which is his last movie. Um, I think he's, you know. If there would be two, since this is a year end discussion, you know, he's kind of somebody I would, I'm very eager to see what he does because, you know, Mind's Eye is kind of like scanners. It's kind of a look at like, hey, here's a new, mm-hmm. right. a new way of looking at scanners. Almost Human was almost like, here's a new way of looking at Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So I kind of like seeing that because it feels fresh and it feels interesting. And as I said before, you know, I, I, I get so tired of the same old thing and it's, but and I don't really like the remakes either, and so to me this is a great way to both experience kind of the the phenomena of the remake and then also to experience something you know something new, but using the same tools you know that I like I like the you know the soundtrack and I like the posters and I like that feeling of the 1980s you know film. So I really really liked his um, uh, his stuff um, and you know I guess I'm 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 not going to add any other films, but I am going to say that you know. Uh, you know, when we, you know, just through this conversation, you know, earlier, um, Brian, you had said something about invitation, you know, and I'm guessing uh, your listeners are mm-hmm. writing down titles and things like, oh, I'll have to check that out. Um, I would disagree with you before. I think that invitation was pretty hyped um, in, in, in the right circles. I think that through the conventions that I had heard quite a bit about that uh, fanfare for that going in. And even from this conversation, I've written down about a half a dozen titles you know, that I, I plan on watching. Um, oh, and then actually I will add one more for those of you who have like myself have kind of come off of, um, uh, Oh my God. Uh, green inferno. Uh, Eli Roth. Has, uh, uh, Oh, Roth. Eli Roth. Eli Roth. Uh, I've kind of, kind of had enough of him. I think, uh, here, here. I, I was kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, every movie he comes out with, you're like, Oh, here's a new Eli Roth movie. And then you're like, Oh, well kind of didn't really hit me right. But I, you know, and I don't really like the whole clown thing. I think it's kind of like overplayed this all. Oh, no, I'm afraid of clowns. You know, it's kind of a hip thing to right. think now to be afraid of clowns. And I know there are people out there that have legitimate clown phobias. But um, his movie, The Clown, <laughs> yes. which was last year, so it doesn't necessarily fit with this. But it, mm-hmm. it's, it's I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like such a great monster movie. And as I said before, there aren't really yeah. a lot of those being made anymore. And that I thought that one was a really was really effective it was really really enjoyable and it really had two things yeah. going against it for me going into it so i would mention that and uh coherence is not a horror film but john did mention that do your film favor and watch that it was fantastic so yeah that's a, that's a great one coherence and i have to say i really like clown as well it kind of reminded me of uh uh rare exports in how it was going down the old uh, concepts of lore and legend around what is modern, somewhat benign, and the idea of what clowns used to be. So it was kind of fun in that way. And it still had its tongue firmly in cheek, but when it decided right. to go dark, it really did go dark. But go I'm going to tell you a movie that I told you guys to watch, and I bet you haven't yet, is Roar. I have not, and I'm going to watch it tonight. I told Damn it. you guys last time I know, to see this. I know, I know, and you're absolutely right. I've mentioned it like six <laughs> times to my wife. I've watched, showed her the trailer, and she's like, my God, which means I have to watch it at night. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I certainly uh, need to see that because that's most It's one of the newer craziest film? films I've seen recently. Unintentional horror. Yeah, not horror, but horrifying it's, and what happens. It's the Tippi Hedren uh, movie where they had – lions at their house and Jan de Bont I think was the original documentarian everybody yeah. in the movie gets mauled if I remember correctly pretty much yep yeah. do you hear about no, this one Greg? it's an older film then it came out in 81 but it just got released on a blu-ray a few no, years ago I, I take your uh, in your recommendation on the um on the older film there, the one that you liked the best in October. Oh, no. children should have played with dead things. <laughs> the black and white one, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the ghost story. Oh, oh, uh, Man, I cannot remember. The haunting. No, no. Um, uh, Oh, uh, yeah. I can't think of it. Uh, the innocence, the innocence. Oh yes. Excellent. That, excellent. That film. Completely blew me away too. Yeah. John Carpenter actually references that. He said that his idea of Michael Myers came from that unnerving thing of the kids standing oh, no, across yeah. from the the river that he came yeah, that, up with that, the idea of that's a yeah it really does seem like that i think if that you were if you were to, if you were able to take your sensibilities from now and just watch that movie without having 
if you could transport yourself back and watch that movie, uh, you know, with fresh eyes, that would be terrifying. I can't imagine somebody watching that movie when it came out and not being like, you know, having not, not having that intense feeling because, yeah. you know, it really breaks a lot of the, there's a lot of things you don't expect it to be in that movie. So, I mean, I think now when you watch it, you know, you have to put on your, your lens of, you know, you look through it through the lens of time a little bit. I did think it was really good, but I think. It, it's, you know, yeah. It I never saw that movie before. And, and this was my first time seeing it. And, you know, it, you think a movie from the sixties wouldn't have so much of an effect at, at this point in time. But I tell you that movie, floored me it was one of the best films i've seen in a long time oh my goodness that just made me flash and john will probably be able to help me with the name of it otto preminger film bunny the bunny lake is missing bunny lake is missing you want to talk a movie that'll get your jaw dropping if you haven't seen it bunny lake is missing is so not of its time it is really, really bizarre and the uh, the acting in it is great uh, another one in there this that like you mentioned, is not at this time. That's amazing that it got made at that time is 10 Rillington Place. Oh, yes. Wow. I mean, the fact that what that, I mean, it's based on a real life serial killer in mm-hmm. England filmed in the place where it happened. Yes. Um, is just unreal. And Richard Attenborough, who plays the main character, is just so chilling. Easily one of the creepiest killers I've ever seen in a movie. And that. Makes me think of another movie, Angst. Have you ever seen Angst from 1983? Lost masterpiece, a quote unquote masterpiece. It's really, really surreal. I think Gaspar Noe, who did Irreversible and stuff, he claims that that's the movie that he bases a lot of his visuals on. And it is 1983, but it is so damn surreal. And they use this really strange, like, halo effect uh like they put a bar on the actors and the cameras on the end so the background is constantly moving but the actor is still in the center and they do multiple variations of that through this movie and it's based on an actual killer who murdered people in austria it if it's not the actual setting it sure damn feels like it and uh when i was first watching it i'm going i don't understand why this movie was given an x rating i don't understand why this was banned from xyz and then by the end of it i'm going wow that's just tone that's feel it it's not how many bodies or anything like that it's just a seriously creepy film angst if you get a chance worth seeing if you can find it uh, brian do you have any last words on uh movies that we should be watching um i'll just say a few things Demons. um <laughs> And I'll try to. Keep... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those that don't know, there's a long-standing joke. Uh, the most passionate demons fan in the world is Brian Martinez. Oh, stop. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I, I'm. I, I would like to come out here on your show and admit to you guys something, and that's my my quitting of uh, watching Rob Zombie films um, because okay. uh, I I really tried. You know, I, I tried to be a fan of his, but. 31 just kind of put me over the edge and I really really I dislike that film like Doomhead is amazing in the movie but I don't know I just it's just more of the same stuff and I you know I'm sure there's Rob Zombie fans out there that dig his thing but I just feel like he's not you know he doesn't care about doing anything new anymore like the, his um his last film um Lord of Salem Lincoln right now Lord of Salem um Lord yeah, of Salem, Lord of Salem. At least that 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 one was enjoyable to me because at least he was trying to do something different um, with some of his same elements. Um, but I don't know. I just thirty one just rubbed me the wrong way, and I don't know if I, it was just I was in the, I was just not in the mood for a Rob Zombie film or whatever. But I I really did not like that. Um, I I will mention that um, I have three films that I have yet to see, but I, they're definitely on my list, and I, I'm hearing so many amazing things about them um mm-hmm. uh train to busan um okay. i keep i keep seeing that everywhere and i, I just i want to sit down and watch that one uh the whaling i hear is really good and uh, i really liked it john has another idea yeah not, not so much <laughs> <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah. um it's a length thing <laughs> i beg your pardon <laughs> there we go <laughs> i really um, like the whaling Oh, and and my, my recommendation is uh, V the the 1967 film uh, from you, you introduced it. I think it's called I think it's called V. Yeah, it's a Russian film. 
Oh yes, yeah. V- yeah, why? It's such, a, such an amazing. Yes, yeah. It's a, it's a Which great. Which I film. think they there is a remake of that, by the way. Oh no. Which I hear uh, is that's another movie. one. Idiosyncratic. It's such an idiosyncratic film. You'll never be able to get that flavor again. It's just. Uh, it's of its yep. own thing. I mean, just the way that V looks at the end, uh, you yeah. know, they'll change that up and it worked perfectly for that film. Well, yeah. I want to thank you guys. You gave me so much of your time uh, and it was really fun to be able to share a little bit of what I really enjoy when I go to see conventions uh, and I get to meet you guys late at night. Uh, the audience gets to know a little bit about that. I am sure that there's plenty of things that people certainly want to watch. Uh, they may never, ever want to watch 31 now. Thanks, Brian. No. <laughs> and uh, Seriously, don't watch it. Don't watch it. It was a pretty lazy yeah. movie, but it did have a Nazi <laughs> minion in it that was dressed as a clown, and I got to give props to well, that. Well, it sure did have that. I, I, I can't deny that. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys again, and uh, I want to thank the audience as well to, for listening to the show. Uh, this is Hellbent for Horror, and until next time, stay hellbent. And thanks for listening to my show. I'd love to hear back from you. You can email me directly at scott at hellbentforhorror.com. And I've also updated my Hellbent for Horror website, hellbentforhorror.com. You can download every episode directly from there, read any newsletters, and you can go to any of my social websites and emails all from the homepage. You can IM me on my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror. And you can find me on Twitter at hellbenthorror. A lot of the great conversations I have with fans happens on Twitter at hellbenthorror. Now, for you, the listeners of Hellbent for Horror, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Hellbent for Horror. If you like the show and you're curious about audiobooks, sign up for the service through Hellbent for Horror. It helps make this podcast sustainable for me. I thank you in advance. And thank you for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can now subscribe to the Hellbent for Horror podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Player FM, and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. It really helps. Till next time, stay hellbent.